True Romance was Quentin's first screenplay to get produced. He had apparently written a number before that. But I think in light of the direction his later career took, I think it's very interesting that he used a specific kind of genre fiction as the title uh, for this movie. And again, I, like a lot of his titles, I find it to be sort of ironic at the same time because you can, you can say many things about a, uh, a, a love affair that's based on shared interests, but I don't think shared interests necessarily makes for a true romance. Unless you're looking at the word romance in a sort of different tense, you know. Um, uh, and, and this movie also is, is really the only one of his pictures that takes comic books as a, as a really strong point of reference. I mean, in, in Reservoir Dogs, uh, you get little things like when, uh, when Tim Roth says that Lawrence Tierney looks like the thing in the Fantastic <laughs> Four, you know. Which he does. a very funny yeah. line. Yeah, it wouldn't be funny if it weren't true. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, here you've got this this wonderful dream date of the uh, the triple feature of of the Sonny Chiba films, and then he blindfolds her, and they go to a comic, comic book store, store, and he says these romantic words: "Want to see what Spider Man number one looks like?" You know, <laughs> yeah. they won my heart with that. Yeah, exactly. But I was just thinking about how this is a movie that its influence is spread to the with Pineapple Express. Basically, James Franco's character is based on Brad Pitt in that movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see that mm -hmm. as the taking off point for that. You're just taking that guy and building an entire movie around him or a, a whole plot line. You can see that that's where it came from. And it's, it was from the first times I thought, well, maybe Brad Pitt does have something because he's so great that and perhaps my favorite scene in the movie, and there's so much fun stuff in it, although it's a little. A little too glossy and sort of the stylization mm -hmm. sort of gets in the way of the storytelling. Um, you sort of see where his strengths are. That he, you know, he knows enough to know if you stay out of the way of, of the of the dialogue, it works on its own. You don't have to gloss it up or overcut. But the sequence, because it's one of the few things that there's not a lot of cutting between Brad Pitt and James Gandolfini. Oh, when that scene ends and he says, "Condescend to me." <laughs> <laughs> Condescending to me. Yeah, that's so great. <laughs> That's so wonderful. I wouldn't be surprised if that was improvised, but it's just just so in character, so in character. It's perfect. And that's such a that's and that's such a great character. And and it, it's it's a it's one of the movies that does a lot of stuff that he later does. Like it's it's about movies. Mm -hmm. That whole sequence at the end with the one of the many versions of Joel Silver who seen his way into the movies <laughs> so, during that decade, but this is being the best version of that and the great performance by Saul Rubinek who once he realizes, I mean, basically everybody falls in love with Clarence because he's playing this movie version of his own life. I mean, mm -hmm. the first time we sort of see that realized, but again, it's, it's, it's overemphasized a little bit, uh, but that everybody falls in love with this guy who is starring in his own movie. I mean, just the Tom Spice. Story. I love this kid. I mean, and then Saul Rubin, I love this kid. Everybody falls in love with him. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that Quentin has said that this is his most autobiographical script, and I think that you 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 feel it with Clarence because I think like Quentin, he's somebody who you know I think Quentin you know got into making movies not just because he loved movies and because he wanted to make them, but because he he wished he could be in the movies you know that he loved, and I think that that Clarence has that same fantasy, and I think that uh, that's where you really feel that that personal connection. And I, I, th I think, too, that what's, you can't not love a movie that has Gary Oldman with dreadlocks yeah. <laughs> obsessed with the Mac. <laughs> and and it, it is, for Tony Scott, a very subdued film. I mean, you know, he really, he does let the dialogue and the performances carry it. and you To know, the it, extent that he can. Yeah, I mean, but if you, I mean, really in his filmography, it's it's probably one of his least souped up in terms yeah. of style, in terms of moving the camera a lot and fast cutting and that sort of thing, you know. There's a compliment in there somewhere, isn't there? <laughs> no, I like Tony Scott a lot, actually. But I think all, uh, a, a lot of the time, you know, he's making up for deficiencies in the script. And, you know, that here he, he you know, realized he had a better piece of material. I think it's probably the only time in Tony Scott's career that he was the second choice after William Lustig to direct the movie, <laughs> and and you know you, it's hard to imagine two two uh, you know more opposed sensibilities. Um, but William uh, Lustig and anybody you can, that that sentence <laughs> offers itself up in so many different. But ways. It, but it's an interesting it's an interesting fact that that Quentin has said 
that, you know, William Lustig having been a big hero of his, that when he was developing True Romance, he saw that at every turn, William Lustig was turning it into a more conventional piece of material and that that was really crushing to him. But he was smart enough to know that they should move on to somebody else. And probably, again, a lot of people wouldn't have had that foresight, you know, I mean, especially, you know, young guy just starting out, you know, trying to work with one of his heroes. So, uh, it, it again, I think it speaks to his 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 incredible instincts as a, as a filmmaker. It's almost like the stories, when I heard those stories about Lustig, about, well, Schrader, Paul Schrader telling me at one point that there's going to be a version of Taxi Driver directed by Robert Mulligan starring Jeff Bridges. <laughs> and he just thought, this doesn't seem right, but he was desperate to get the movie made. But he realized finally, to the extent that he had any say over it, he had to stop it because it wasn't enough to get it made because who knows, how many, at that point in your career, how many chances you're going to mm -hmm. have. you got to go with the best person for the job, mm -hmm. which turned out to be Tony Scott. And, I mean, the scene that everybody always talks about, and we yeah. and got to this. Is, <laughs> yes. It's, which is... It's, well, I mean, and that's the scene that, if you have any doubts about the author, the authorship of this film and how much of the script ended up on the screen, I mean, that is almost the quintessential Quentin you know, monologue. It's not quite a monologue, but almost seen. And I, I'll have to say, I mean, I don't know whether it's Tony Scott or just the two performers who were so great, but it is acted, you know, so beautifully. Um, you know, Walken just doing this, barely suppressed, I mean, this this burn that's building. And you know that, that the fact that, you know, that Hopper is doing this because he's much better off if he gets this guy angry so that he's going to be able to die fast. And, and it's never spoken, and I think everybody there, he knows that's what he's doing. Walken knows that he's doing that, and it makes no difference. And it's, it's just a, a wonderful uh, monologue slash dialogue scene. And it's also great, too, the way that uh, Patricia Arquette sort of takes control of that torture scene. Because mm -hmm. you were talking about torture porn before, and in the wrong hands, that would have taken such a weird, ugly turn. And but it, it's literally, as well, I mean, physically as well as emotionally, about her wresting the power away from him. Yeah, she's and, strengthened by every blow, really. And him misjudging her in that mm -hmm. way that, and again about a piece of information that she has that she she can take it, and he, again that sort of that that sort of basically craftsman of mayhem kind of thing. This is what he does, and he's really good at it, and he likes to do it. I mean, you can see the connection between that character and and Vic Vega in Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, isn't there a, a mention in, in Reservoir Dogs where somebody talks about working with Alabama? Yes. You know, um, so I, I don't know if you know what what the connection is there, but but someone mentions having worked with Alabama before. Maybe it was Quentin just putting a thread of continuity between his his screenplays. I don't know if he literally means the same character uh, in in that character's past, but uh, you know, considering where where she came from, who knows what stories she lived through before <laughs> she arrived at uh, at Clarence's comic book shop. But I can't help but wonder if a movie of that kind of script could ever get made in a studio again. Well, even then, it was made under the auspices of Morgan Creek, which is still around, um, but um, unlikely, probably. One thing that I think of, or actually a couple of things that I think of in relation to Quentin and his importance, um, is uh, what one thing is that he tr what he tried to do with the uh, the series of Rolling Thunder films that he was doing, actually taking movies that were influential to him and putting them back into theaters. Um, so I, I, I think that that was a, a, a really valiant effort, and I also love the fact that he took over uh, the uh, the debts at the uh, at the New Beverly Theater here mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, uh, a, a important repertory theater here in town uh, that invites filmmakers to come and speak about their films. And he said, you know, as as long as I have my money, you know, the, the New Beverly never needs to close. That's a great gift to the city. Um, but I, I just think that, that so much about his work is consciousness raising about uh, a whole world of films, not not just any any specific genre, but a whole world of films that people were largely not conscious of before. 
and he makes them not only interesting to people, but he makes them relevant in a strange way. Well, I think so many people automatically think of Tarantino's films as action movies, or they're violent, they're really bloody, but actually they're they take a degree of patience. I mean, you really have to watch a Tarantino movie. You can't just sort of leave the room and go do other things. I mean, you can, but they, they're a little demanding in a way. I mean, and also there's, the visual storytelling is so precise. And even though there's a lot of dialogue in his movies, there isn't a lot of expository dialogue. There isn't a lot of, well, this character is doing this because thus and such, which so many filmmakers do nowadays. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's something that's kind of overlooked that here is somebody who really has spent a lifetime looking at movies, really taking them apart, and then has learned to make them, to make the, the kinds of movies that he himself loves watching. And I just think, I, I think that's a great thing. And also, Tim, as you said, um, Saving the New Beverly was just, you know, an incredibly generous act. And, um, just and great. it's led to great programming, quite frankly. Yeah. Be well. Probably better than what they had previously. Yeah, I mean, having spent countless hours <laughs> of my early years in Los Angeles at the New Beverly as it existed at that time, I, 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 nothing has, you know, made me happier than to see the, the new lease on life that that theater has gotten. I mean, it's not just that it's not just that Quentin took over their debts and has has been really instrumental in getting, you know, people like Edgar Wright and Diablo Cody and himself involved as guest programmers, which has just, you know, hugely increased the audience there. But the theater's also been dramatically upgraded in terms of the projection and the sound and the seats. And it's actually... Some of the seats. It's, it's a pretty comfortable <laughs> place to watch a movie now, which it really, you know, wasn't at the time. But you went there because the programming was great. And, you know, it was a way to see movies on the big screen that I certainly wasn't seeing in film school. Um, I think of the, the movies that, that uh, Quentin released under the Rolling Thunder label, one that, that I always thought was particularly important was Sonatine by uh, Takeshi Kitano, because that, I think, was the beginning of wider acknowledgement of his work in the U.S. And, uh, and, and of course, he eventually came to, to make a film in Los Angeles that I, I liked quite a lot called Brother. And, uh, you know, one thing leads to another. Uh, I mean, I think basically, you know, Quentin's one of the good soldiers of cinema, so we're lucky to have him. Yeah, I mean, finally, there's no cynicism in him about this. You know, it's it's all about finding a way to bring these enthusiasms. And I don't know if any of you ever had a chance to go to the film festivals he would throw in Austin, which were ostensibly endurance tests, but actually you would you would get energized by each succeeding film because you realize the amount of care that went into putting these things together. And finally, for me, that's the enduring legacy that goes both from his filmmaking as well as his stewardship of the medium itself is finding a way to communicate these enthusiasms to everybody else. And people, I think, generally can feel that energetic love of film.